everyone. Happy Wednesday. Thanks for joining us on our uh, monthly Women in Housing Network virtual roundtable. We're excited for uh, this month, and it's hard to believe it's already December uh, and that we have had another full year of virtual roundtables. Um, and so we're excited for this month's um, topic of vendors and uh, women vendors and in our field. That was the really bad job of describing the topic of this, but we all got it, right? Like it's December, so everybody's brain feels maybe a little like August. Um, and so um, so excited to have Catherine and Lisa join us today. We did have a third panelist, but um, she was unable to make it today. So excited to hear from both Lisa and Catherine. Before I turn it over and start asking them questions, just wanted to take a second and introduce myself because I just realized I didn't do that. Uh, my name is Michelle Soika and I am at the University of Cincinnati. Um, and I also serve as chair elect for the Women in Housing Network. Um, and I'm excited to see folks here today. Um, I don't know if Paige is able to get on and introduce herself. I saw she just joined us, but if she can, um, oh, there she is. Hi, um, my name is Paige Hicks, so you should hear his pronouns. I am an assistant director here at the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm excited to be a part of this or watch and learn today. Awesome. Thanks, Paige. All right. Well, we are going to turn it over to Catherine and Lisa. And so um, you all can choose who wants to go first. But if you can just take a moment and introduce yourself to the group and share with us how you got into the role that you're in right now. <laughs> we're, we're, we're being that nice. Like, you want to go? You want to go? Um, I think she pointed at me. So my name is Catherine Magura Krieger. Uh, I am an account executive with Starus. So um, I think a lot of you probably know Starus is a housing software company. Uh, my name might be familiar to some of you because I did spend over 20 years working in higher education housing. Um, I was very involved with uh, Akuhawai in my tenure working in housing. Uh, I joined Starus in January of this year. So uh, almost a whole year uh, working outside of housing. So uh, I know a lot of you are, are uh, managing winter closing and break housing and um, not gonna lie, I don't miss having to do that. I, I appreciate the work <laughs> you're doing, but I, I don't miss it. Um, and then I think was the question how I got into this or are we just doing intros? Okay, um, I got into this so, I was in housing operations in, at Oregon State University, and we had just implemented STARAs on our campus a little over a year ago. And I was working remotely. I had relocated to the Midwest during the pandemic to get married. And uh, the decision was made by campus leadership to have everyone back in person as of January 22. Um, so it did not matter that I had been working a year and a half remotely. I had to kind of figure out what my next steps were. And, it just kind of so happened that a position with Starez came open as I was really needing to ramp up my search. And here I am in a sales role, which is, you know, there's a lot of similarities to housing operations, but it's also very different in many ways. But that's how that's how I got here. Lisa, your turn. I can locate the unmute button, right? <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa Farrell. I'm with Microfridge. It's that little refrigerator, freezer, microwave, all in one plug. Uh, we invented it about, oh gosh, 35 years ago. And I have been with Microfridge in some capacity for 24 years. So it's been an interesting ride. I started out in marketing in Boston, Massachusetts. And a few years later, my husband and I were relocating and they said, all right, we'll give you an opportunity in sales. You have one year to prove yourself. <laughs> so basically 20 years later, here I am. And I was able to see so much of the country all over the Western coast, Midwest, uh, as national manager, sales manager. And what has kept it fresh for me for that long is that my job is constantly evolving. I constantly learn new things and meet new people and it, it really has impacted me and the fact that I can work right from home is a huge plus <laughs> so that's me in a nutshell 
Awesome. Thank you. Um, so let's let's dive into some of our additional questions. Um, and we did get some questions from the group, and we'll definitely make sure we get to those. And if you do have questions, feel free to throw them into the chat. We want to make sure that you all have an opportunity to ask questions that you may have for these folks as well. So um, first question, what are some of the highlights of working in your field or industry? And then the second part of that question, what are the challenges you face specifically as a woman in your role? And would you like me to address that first? Sure. Okay. Uh, the highlights of working in my industry, is, and I just touched upon it, but it's basically that I, we continue to evolve and change. Uh, new products, new faces, new schools. Uh, well, that's the good part. The challenges, I would say, probably more internal with the company itself versus my customers. With being in a predominantly male company, <laughs> you have to always have your ducks in a row, right? And what I try to do is remove my emotion from the situation. So if something's going on, I have to say, okay, what are the facts, Lisa? Think about the facts, think about what you want, and you have to then communicate the facts without the emotion. And I'm a very emotional person. So, so basically that has been a really challenging thing for me. And I have developed... Uh, a keen eye for being able to compartmentalize things and be able to think through what my challenges are so that I can communicate effectively without being told, oh, you're just a girl type of thing. Um, and it is challenging for women because we do have some emotions tied to, we're, we're very passionate about our work. We want to make sure that we're getting it done. Um, but yeah trying to to be as factual as possible I would think. another part of that question no nope, I think I answered it <laughs> you got it Lisa mm -hmm. and I think in my role one of the things that I'm enjoying a lot is I now get to connect with people who do the work I used to do and see if Starrez might be a good fit for them on their campus. And so being able to help other people solve problems that I'm very aware of from my housing days is very validating. I also get paid pretty well for that, which is a nice change from working in higher education. Um, I think one of the, the challenges is this is a sales role and there's quotas that come with that. And it's this is a private industry. And so um, there's none of those developmental conversations that we're used to in higher ed and all those things. It's a, here's your quota. What do, what do you need to make that? Um, and it is kind of to what Lisa was saying. It's it's a very male dominant uh, company still, and our leadership is predominantly um, white men. And so uh, I do feel fortunate that I'm able to even have conversations with my supervisor about how um, it's hard when I don't see myself or underrepresented groups uh, represented in our leadership and that feedback is, is received and, and taken. Um, I don't know that there are a lot of private industries that have that ability to have those kinds of conversations, but I'd, I'd say that's the challenge. And so, um, and again, not coming from a sales role, I, I honestly didn't know how it was going to feel moving to that side, um, but turns out I'm doing pretty good. So, and I joined the company around the same time, about two months after another woman who came from higher ed and uh, for a little while there, last month, we were the two top sellers in the company. So that felt pretty good. That is awesome. Um, I'm going to ask a follow-up question um, to Lisa, but Catherine, I saw you nodding your head as well. So happy to hear your thoughts too. But the um, emotion piece is really real, right? Like what kind yeah. of tips do you have for folks um, for helping to remove that emotion and really just kind of stick to the facts when you're communicating, especially when you're communicating with the men in your company? Don't take things personally. Do not internalize. <laughs> and I, I, in my younger years, and I mean, even maybe a few years back, I, I would always think, oh, you know, 
it's all about me. And don't, don't make assumptions going in. Try to clean the slate and say, okay, let's look at this logically and figure out what do you need out of the situation and, and try to communicate that effectively. But it's basically coming in with predetermined ideas and feelings and you have to just wipe that slate clean. And uh, yeah, the assumptions. I don't know, what do you think, Kathleen? Yeah, and I think for me too, there was a lot of the imposter syndrome that went into this, like, can I do this? Why am I here? Um, and, you know, kind of taking that narrative and flipping it, flipping it of, well, why, why wouldn't I be here? Like, why can't I do this? Um, why, well, I've never done this before, but I, I needed a change and, um, I think I can do this and I want to give it a chance. Like what happens if I do it well and all of that? And I, I, I agree. It's a trying to remove the emotion out of it. I think some of the emotion that I've had to, to manage to is in a sales rule, you get a lot of rejection. Yes. You get more rejection than you get people saying, yes, I want to buy your product. Um, and now I feel guilty for all the times I would just delete vendor emails uh, when I worked in housing, because I was like, ah, I have time for this, and I was like, oh man, I could have at least just said re the response of no, thank you, or we're not we're not purchasing anything at this time. But um, yeah, just kind of getting past that rejection of it has absolutely nothing to do with me as a person. It's just more about um, one, can I get past spam filters, which are pretty stringent on a lot of higher ed campuses, and two, is this even the right time for someone to be looking at our product? Yeah, you have to be confident in yourself for sure. You have to say, okay, remove those doubts yeah. and just say, this is about the business and they're not rejecting you. They're, re they're rejecting the concept at the time, right? Yeah. Or they just don't need it. <laughs> yeah. and, really, and that's okay. Maybe 10 years, five years down the road, they will need it. That's well, awesome. And because they responded to an email, they know who to reach out to. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. I love it. Um, so, so thinking about kind of as, as Catherine was talking, um, so one of the things that was kind of ringing in my head was about like having that support group or those folks to help, you know, either bounce ideas off, help you remove that emotion, whatever that looks like. So can you talk a little bit about um, kind of a both ends, like what is your support group look like for you around work, but also like, how do you find mentorship in your role as you think about advancing or bettering your skills and being a stronger person in your role? With a coin? <laughs> um, well, I think for us, they build in kind of mentorship as part of our training. And so, um, you know, coming from over 20 years doing similar work to completely changing up my profession was a bit humbling. Um, even just, you know, getting my outlook set up the way that I like it uh, was, it took me some time because I hadn't had to switch outlook um, settings in a very long time. So uh, knowing that it's okay to ask questions to, to people who've been here longer or who are in more of those leadership roles and being willing to ask questions, even if I think it's something that I should know, just not being afraid to ask the questions, because it's similar to what I used to tell my staff, and especially the students that I would work with, is I would rather answer questions multiple times than you not ask questions and something gets done wrong. Um, I'd rather us have that open conversation, and uh, I appreciate that, that that does seem to be supported here in this environment. For me, since I do work remotely, I don't know if that's true for you too, Catherine. You know, yep. So my my coworkers are virtual as well, um, but we have a new co I have a new coworker who recently came on board, and she has a lot of industry experience, but in a different you know different type of product. But it's always great to bounce ideas off of her uh, because I appreciate that she's had the longevity that she has. And just say, okay, how do we reframe this so that it works for me or you know, how do we approach this? And I think it's finding those women that you do have some synergy with, that do have the longevity uh, and, and just bouncing ideas. And sometimes you come up with your own solution, right? Mm -hmm. But you need to talk it out, whether it be coworkers or friends that you have that are in similar situations that are, are working women. And every now and then I bounce it off my husband because he is no emotion. <laughs> we make a good yin and yang 
I'm like, okay, if I, pre I presented this to you, how would you react? He's like, well, and he'll just give me the facts as well. But mostly from my women coworkers and uh, fellow vendors, we go to these trade shows and there's a lot of downtime. So we swap stories, right? We talk about, okay, where have you been? And how do you find this? And, and who's the person at this school? So it, it's great to have those relationships in and out of the company. Awesome. Yeah, no, that was awesome. That was great. Um, so, so higher ed, uh, you know, we're, there's no secret about the great resignation in higher ed and folks are looking to leave and, um, which is great. You know, if that's where their heart takes them and their skill set, then, then that is what folks need to do. Um, and so maybe we have some folks on here who are interested in leaving higher ed or exploring the idea, um, and working in an adjacent industry. What are some of those tips or tricks you have in, um, making that shift um, into that role. And then I'll have a follow-up question afterwards, but any suggestions for shifting into a more um, adjacent role? I think the first advice I give people who do this is um, if you're not on LinkedIn, get on LinkedIn. And if you're on LinkedIn, really start um, building up your profile there. Uh, I know a bunch of people who've gotten jobs via LinkedIn connections and technically, uh, I got my referral for the Star Wars job via LinkedIn as well. So I guess I'm one of those success stories. Uh, but I, I had never really used LinkedIn a whole ton before I started ramping up my job search. And then um, I saw people getting jobs through there. And I was like, oh, that is something that I should probably be looking at. Um, so that's, that's the first piece of advice that I give to anyone who's looking to get out. And then the other thing I would advise is you absolutely have skills to do a lot of things in a lot of other industries. You've got transferable skills. If you've worked in housing residence life, that can tick off so many you know, emergency management, supervision, training, planning, like all of these different things. There's a lot of fields out there who are looking for people with your skill set. It's just a matter of being able to articulate what you've done and the skills that you have in a way that will get through to some of those companies. Well, I agree with Catherine 100%, and I think she is closer to this and able to speak more intelligently about it. But I even have uh, stay-at-home mom friends who want to get back into the workforce, and I just constantly remind them, as Catherine said, about transferable skills, problem solving, troubleshooting. These are things that employers are working, uh, looking for, and especially people who are willing to work and have that commitment which believe it or not, it's it's very scarce these days. So the fact that you have uh, a drive and are committed to success, that is 80% of the job. And reach out, I'll just add another piece here, reach out to people who've done it. Um, I have probably at least one conversation a week with someone in higher ed who's looking to get out and they don't know where to start. And I know for me, I'm always willing to have those conversations and I know other people who've gotten out who are also willing to have them. Um, I like helping other people find uh, something that's gonna value their skill sets. And so I'm always happy to be a resource and I think others are as well. Awesome, thank you. Also, Catherine is very much on LinkedIn. And so like, um, if you need tips, <laughs> then maybe Catherine would be willing to do that. I know I'm not, I'm a once a weeker on um, on LinkedIn, but um, so the follow-up question. So this was from a participant, um, Neelam, and I hope that I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, had asked, once you're out, how do you adjust to having life and not being busy all the time? I had the most misplaced guilt <clears throat> after I started my Star Wars job uh, because it was, it, it, especially when you work in sales, it takes time to build up a pipeline. Um, and so when I first got started, it, it, I wasn't busy. And I was talking to the, the team who was training me and they're like, remember this feeling because at some point that's going to change. And it, it has changed. I'm busy now, but even then, like, I don't work evenings. I don't work weekends. I don't check my email after hours either. And it took a while to get past the guilt and it was misplaced. I call it my misplaced guilt of 
of not working beyond what would be a typical week. Um, and I, I had to unlearn both that behavior and the value that had been placed in that behavior over time. And um, it, it, it's, it's interesting too, because when, when I moved and I got married, I now had stepkids and a family and my priority was no longer my job. I mean, I was doing my job, but it was no longer the biggest priority for me. And once that shift happened, it was easier for me to then make the change to, oh, I can have a quote unquote normal job that doesn't overwork me and undercompensate. Awesome. Thanks. Lisa, I, I, I don't think I have anything to add because <laughs> Catherine has that experience. Yeah. Yeah, Neelam, that, that guilt is real, right? And so it's hard. Even I was sharing with folks before we started this, I've got two little sick ones at home and like I took a mental health day for me on Monday and now I was out with kids, you know, today and um, yesterday and we'll be for part of the day tomorrow. So all that guilt is um is misplaced guilt you're right and you know having the mom friends for me it was having the mom friends to say like no no you did exactly what you're supposed to do even for yourself even for your kids so um we women have a lot of misplaced guilt I appreciate that that phrase as well Paige um is you're writing that one down all right so um Let's see, where are we at in our question? So your um, professional development space, can you talk with us a little bit about what that looks like? We're obviously on an Aku Hawaii call and platform. And so uh, many of us probably look to Aku Hawaii and regional associations for our professional development or some of our professional development. What does that look like in your spaces? I can speak to that. Um, my personal experience, a few years ago, I did ask the CEO uh, for continued education. I said, is there a way that we can have some sort of continued education, um, sales 101, Excel 101, PowerPoint? There are things that we could continue to grow and learn. So we actually do now have a site, Danby University. Danby is our parent company. And if you need to brush up on product information or IT information, shortcuts about how to do things on Excel, pivot tables, this, that, and the other. The, everything is in one spot so that you can just educate yourself. And I, I think it's absolutely wonderful. In fact, I had an educational session with my direct manager yesterday, specifically on pivot tables, because I would remember a portion and then I'd forget. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, we have to put columns and then rows and this and that. But what helps is that it then gives me more time to do the things that I need to really focus on. Where I was spending two or three hours on Excel spreadsheets, I now spend one hour. So it's all about trying to be have a, a more efficient workplace. So thank you, Danby. <laughs> yeah, professional development was one of the areas that I struggled with with my my change to the corporate world because. Um, that was one area that in higher ed I had always been really supported with and like there was natural like get involved in the QI and your regional association like Michelle was saying and I wasn't sure how that looked in this world um, but there's always support for anything that I want to do for professional development we do a lot of sales training um, there's a number of people who do specific how to how to how to sell and that kind of stuff and there's training. And some of that was prescribed as part of my onboarding was doing some of this. And uh, one of the things that I've really come to enjoy in, in the corporate world is um, when you have expenses, you get reimbursed very quickly in this world. And you don't have to argue for why you gave a 20% tip for Uber versus 15% or all these things. No one questions. You just submit your, your receipts. And by the end of the week, you get paid. Like, oh, that's that's how that should work. That is so real. <laughs> that is so real. I don't know about other people. And well, I think we get paid pretty quickly for ours, but still it's, 
not as quickly as what I would hope or imagine, um, as Catherine just described. So um, I just wanted to encourage folks, and I put this in the chat as well, if you have questions for our panelists or for the, the greater group, please feel free to drop those in the chat. Happy to help answer any questions that you all might have too. Um, we had another one submitted during the registration from um, Angelique, and she had asked, what are ways to go about asking for additional compensation when you take on additional tasks from a coworker um, that is out for a medical reason? And how do you build the case and advocate for needs um, with your like supervisor? So I don't know if y'all want to tackle that one. I, I've had to do this in the past. And again, try to remove the emotion because I know that you're thinking I deserve this, I da da da, and and, and sometimes we can um, be emotional without giving the reasons why. And it's very important to say, okay, here's what my job looked like three months ago, and now I've added X, Y, Z tasks and this, and in that there should be some sort of additional compensation. We are we didn't. Fill in, we didn't backfill the, the role. So we do, we should have some sort of um, salary in there to help compensate me for my extra duties. And I'm happy to do them. <laughs> you, it, again, you have to be positive and authentic at the same time. But just be factual. And I, I think that's that's the road you should take. Yeah, and I've, I haven't experienced this in my corporate position yet, but I do know that if you are taking on the tasks for others in our company, you do get paid. It's not even a question. Uh, I have been in this seat with higher ed before, um, and it isn't something that they're like, oh, we should pay you more for taking on tasks for someone else. It's a, generally my experience with higher ed is the, the better you did the job, the more work you got as your reward. Um, and so I, uh, I, I did have to advocate for how I was taking on tasks for someone else. Um, it wasn't for someone who was out for medical. It was someone who had left their position. And we, we uh, were delayed in hiring that position. And so, you know, I, I was able to make a case and um, being able to put the numbers together. Like still, even if they were to pay you, I'm going to just put a number out there, $1,000 more a month. That's still a savings for them on what they would be paying someone in that role, as long as they're still getting it filled. And so being able to put the actual facts together on how it benefits them that you're doing this and you staying and taking these tasks. Now, hopefully they still go through and actually hire that person and don't, don't just give you those tasks permanently without an actual bump in salary, but that's my advice. And don't just take no for an answer because that's the default in higher ed. I agree with that. And I'm going to just chime in. I'm not a panelist, but I'm just going to share because um, so I am in a split system. We're a bifurcated campus here at the University of Cincinnati. And um, I was in student affairs for like eight years of my time here, seven years of my time here, and then shifted over to housing campus services. And I think that there's a big difference between the money maker and the money spender, right, in our um, units. And so in those situations, I did have to ask for money, but when I asked for it, it was like, yeah, of course, but I had to do the ask um, versus now um, that I'm in this department, it's like, hey, we're going to have you cover some nice paternity leave and here's your stipend that you're going to get for it um, in turn. And so I think that that also makes a difference if you know what your unit is, if they're money generators or not, right? Because not in a bifurcated system, you're not always a money generator, then um, um, it, it, the approach can be a little bit different, but I would say ask because the worst you can get is no, and it's always going to be no unless you ask. So, um, and ask with confidence. Yes, please. not like oh, can I please? <laughs> you have to. You have to really believe in yourself and say. And if you have to sandwich it, you know, hey, these are the great things about it, but here's what's happening, and then I deserve it. There should be no question. 
All right. Well, we are um, rolling up kind of on our last questions. Before I offer our last question, I wanted to open it to the group. You're welcome to unmute or um, raise your hand and we can unmute you or you can throw it in the chat. Are there questions that this group has for the panelists or for the group at large? It's cold and rainy in my world, so I'm just imagining it's cold and rainy in everybody else's world as well right now. So maybe not, but. And we were so fascinating. <laughs> that there's so fa no other questions. <laughs> yes, you covered it all. I, before I ask my last question, I'm going off script here a little bit, but um, one of the things that I hear, so my role has shifted more into operations and um, working with our vendors more regularly. And so navigating an exhibit hall or a vendor trade show um, has become more comfortable for me, but for either our younger professionals or folks who don't interact with vendors very often, what are some tips that you would share with folks about how to navigate those spaces, um, especially when they're not a decision maker? I would say have confidence when you approach the booth because someday you will be a decision maker. And if you're not a decision maker, you're definitely an influencer, right? You, you're in rooms where people are making decisions. And at some point, some, someone's gonna ask your opinion. So to be familiar with what's going on and, and how you can add to your university and depending on what vendor, what, what item you're looking for, we are not going to dismiss you because you're not the, the decision maker. I am always interested in helping and educating the new professionals. I've, I've spoken for Wakuho in the past and. Uh, at their pre-meetings and saying, don't be shy. Don't feel like you're wasting my time or someone else's time. No one's wasting any time. Every connection you make, you learn something new. So please go in there with confidence, ask as many questions as you want. And who knows, it might help you the next day or it might help you two years from, that, from then, but please do approach us. Yeah, and uh, Lisa put it really well. And I think we are there at the these exhibit halls to talk with you. Um, we are there to talk to everyone who's there, and we want to have conversations. And you know, we like to talk to the new professionals. We like to talk to the senior decision makers. We, we it helps us fill in the story more if we hear more voices. Um, and I think. You know, as Lisa said, at some point, you probably will be a decision maker. And so being able to know you've had the confidence to go and talk to the micro fridge and the stars teams and, and all of that <clears throat> will make you a better professional and more informed moving forward. Um, also, just, a, just um, a plea, I guess, don't just avoid eye contact with us. We're, we are still people too. Like uh, there's times where I'm sitting there and people will just like, oh, it's a, yeah, they don't want to look at me. And I'm like, um, hi still a person you know i <laughs> promise i won't bite you so I, I walk over and offer them food <laughs> i love it all right we've got a question here we go hi everyone um i actually wanted to introduce myself i saw Catherine's post and that's why i joined in uh but I'm Neelam. I used to work at Pace University as Associate University Director for Housing, but now I'm a manager of project management at a company called WIC. Um, and so I made the jump um, and I got out and happily out right now. So I, I put my LinkedIn in the chat. And so if you want to connect and learn about my transition or anything like that, please, please, please message me. Um, it seemed very, very daunting before I actually did it. But now that I've done it, I'm probably never going to go back. <laughs> Millie, where are you at again? Um, I'm the, I guess it's really my title doesn't match what I do, but I'm sort of like the director of project management at a company called WIC. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a website building company. Um, we manage mm -hmm. newsrooms for, for a lot of big corporations. Congratulations. Thanks. Mm -hmm. She actually pointed out one of the things. So getting used to the titles in the corporate world has been hard. Um, like, oh, I, you know, I can tell you what an assistant director is or director is in higher ed, but like, what is an account executive? What's an account manager? What, what is, what are all these roles? Key account manager, the same thing and 10 different words. I mean, 10 different titles. 
So the importance of reading job descriptions still applies. Yes. I love it. Transferable job descriptions, <laughs> experiences, right? So cool. Neelam, thank you so much for sharing that. I appreciate that. And I saw that your LinkedIn is there in the, in the chat if anybody else did not see that. So thanks for that. Welcome. Are there other questions or just things that folks want to share? I'm going to hop in there. Um, so I have a question. I've had a couple of peers recently make the jump, the transition from um, housing and higher, edu higher education and kind of moving to like higher education adjacent roles. And so when I'm asking people about their transition, some folks have talked about they love their role, um, but it essentially it sounds like that is their one role that they're going to hold on to because there may not be much room for promotion or ascension. And so what does growth look like? Um, are there opportunities for you all to go for higher roles and jobs in the areas that you're at? That's one of the things that I have already appreciated working in Star is, is even my second week on the job, someone internal was getting promoted. Um, and they do reward the people who've been here with promotions, whereas uh, when I was in higher ed, uh, that wasn't the experience all the time. Any promotion I got or any higher level I got at the same institution, I had to fight really hard for. Um, and there were times that I was turned down for those promotions because of the potential fallacy of we need to bring in new voices and new ideas. And while I do think new voices, new ideas are good, I, I ultimately think the best person for the job to get a job in your process should help you get to that. Uh, but there's a lot of internal promotions that happen here. So we, we hire team leads. Of course, it needs to be someone who's been doing the work, getting promoted up into those team leads uh, because they need to train other people on how to do it. Um, but I've seen a lot of promotions from within here, and I appreciate that. I can see growth for me here. I, I would add to that. Uh, yes, there is opportunity for growth. But you definitely need to be your own advocate. Mm -hmm. Do not assume that people, oh, I'm working hard. Everybody sees I'm working hard. No. You need to say, oh, when when the time, when the opportunity is there, here are the things that I've done this week, or here are the things I've done in the past year. You always have to make yourself top of mind to those who are making those decisions. So don't ever assume that people know what you're doing. I think along with that. Higher ed has a very structured evaluation process in res life. Like you typically have your yearly review where you fill it out and your colleagues fill it out and then your director fills it out and God knows whatever, right? That really doesn't happen in the corporate world. It's every company has a different evaluation process. Some companies don't really have an evaluation process. And if you're really good at what you do, you just kind of slide through their stuff, right? So you have to kind of track your own accomplishments and make sure that you're keeping that trail. Um, and it doesn't have to be giant accomplishments, right? Like if you did something that saved the company $20,000, like that's an accomplishment. That's potentially a raise for someone else or a raise for yourself. Like, so those are the things that you have to kind of look out for. And then also keep in mind, the person you're reporting to probably got no supervision skills or development in their lifetime. And so you might be managing up more than you ever thought you were going to manage up in order to make sure that your supervisor understands what you need, but also to make sure that they understand the stuff that they don't get, right? Like I feel like in Housing Res Life, you get taught how to be a supervisor from the moment you're an RD up until you become whatever you become, right? Like this is how you talk nicely to people. This is how you develop people. Like people in the real world or the corporate world don't really get taught that stuff. So be prepared to sometimes get abrasive feedback, knowing that it's really not, they're not intending for it to be abrasive, but sometimes it can be, it come off that way at least. Or if someone's not responding, it may be that they're just so very busy. Mm -hmm. So you have to be proactive and schedule a meeting so that you get one-on-one -on -one time. And do not be afraid to do that because your time is valuable just as their time is. But when you get them and they're focused, then you'll get the answers that you need. And I think one of the hardest things for people who identify as women to learn to do is to brag about yourself. Um, I closed a very big deal last week and I made sure to brag about it to my boss. 
And it felt kind of weird, but also felt really good. And some of our best conversations have been ones where I have been almost like tongue in cheek, but also not like, um, not necessarily egotistical, but when I'm like talking myself up in conversation. So we were having a conversation last week. He's like, I want to check in with you on that deal. And I'm like, I need you to clarify which one I've got so many. And like, he just laughed at that because I just spoke to him and I'm like, this is fun. This is fun. But it's, it's very much beyond what I've been taught my whole life to do as a woman. Right. Men don't hesitate to talk about their accomplishments. So neither should we. I wish they would a little bit. Yeah. Bring it down. It was not here. You really were here. <laughs> that is so true. I love, uh, as you all were sharing some of these tidbits, I think it was um, something that just in the last two years, probably for myself, still in higher ed, where I'm like, oh, you um, got selected to present, tell your boss, right? Oh, you won an award, tell your boss, right? Like, and when other people are like, uh, you know, Michelle did this or Michelle did this, don't be like, oh, it was nothing or, oh, it was a team. No, take the credit, just take the credit and do it um, and, and be proud of that. So I hear all of that resonating here. And so if you're thinking, and I'm just going to share this, so inserting myself into it if you're um if you are um thinking about making that transition start practicing now right and even if you don't make that transition then good on you for bragging about yourself and singing your own praises and and doing all the good work that um others you know others don't focus on you you focus on you so i'll get off my soapbox now have you all received the um the feedback, I heard this pretty early in my professional career, when you've got your, your outlook folders or the emails that you keep, have one that's like your, your praise folder, or your, you know, the, when you get that parent who thanks you for helping, or you get that kudos, save that, but also forward it to your boss, like Michelle just said. My warm fuzzies folder, exactly. Other questions? Good page. Good question, Paige. Thanks for asking that one. All right. Well, um, so our time together is coming towards an end. We still have a little bit of time if folks have more questions, but wanted to just offer, and Neil, please feel free to chime in on this one as well. This is great that you jumped in with us. Um, what are some thoughts or tips or ideas that you have for the group? And we intentionally left it very broad. So feel free to, to share whatever's on your heart or mind. I feel like this is very fresh in my mind because this, my transition just happened in September. So there was a lot of lead up to getting out. And then once I got out, right? Um, LinkedIn can be your best friend, but LinkedIn can be very overwhelming. Don't follow everybody and their mother. Pick the few key people who actually have real things to say, because when um, you're gonna notice a lot of recruiters start posting these ranty posts about like, oh my God, their hiring process shouldn't be this horrible. And oh my God, the recruitment process shouldn't be this, 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 right? Like, and you get into that negative spiral very quickly. You don't need that in your life, right? Like if you're looking to, at the transition process, whether it's a new job in higher ed or outside of higher ed, you need the positive people, not the negative crappy, oh my God, the world sucks people. So I would highly suggest like, be very selective about who you follow because that will determine your the rest of your feed, right? Um, there are people out there who post jobs from everywhere including EdTech, and they post them on their own like posts. Like there's this dude named Jeff Patterson who posts literally every Tuesday with a long list of jobs that are open. Find him. If you, even if you don't like want to apply right now, looking at the job descriptions and seeing what's out there will help you kind of figure out where you want to go. Um, the other thing I learned was create your pseudo elevator pitch. Like it's not necessarily like, a, oh my God, I'm really great. I made $20,000, but it's like, here's who I am, here's what I can do for you, and here's how you reach me. Because you never know when that conversation will come in handy, right? Like even as we're getting into holiday season, maybe you're at a party where a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend is working at this company and you give them this pitch and they're like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. Send me an email and let's talk on Monday. Like there's a lead that you didn't have before. But if you didn't go in with that, you're not ready to have that conversation. You're not gonna be ready to do the follow-up too, right? And that takes practice. 
like you it's very awkward to sit there and be like hi my name is Neelam and in my previous role I made what was it 60 million dollars in housing revenue for a small private liberal arts university in New York right huge numbers big statement right but that's not something we're used to saying but if you once you start getting used to it it's easier to say it in front of strangers um and then my last piece of advice is there's a lot of people out there who claim to be career counselors and will help you land a job be very selective there are so many that have done online certificates and have no experience and will tell you they're going to find you a job and get you nowhere there are a lot of resume writers out there who do the same thing people have wasted thousands of dollars on something that you don't have to waste that much money on um so just background check your people before you trust them um because it's the easiest place to drop money especially if you're I was in a very big state of desperation before I left because I wanted out. I was burnt out. COVID killed me. Like it was it. Like there was nothing that was going to fix that. And so I was almost grasping for anything I could and then had to learn to slow down and really look at the people I was talking to to make sure that I was talking to the right people. Um, and also like just lean out to reach out to other people who've made the jump. They already know what's going on in the universe and they can help you if you really want to do this right now. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo a lot of what Neelam was saying there. Uh, in terms of if you're going to reach out to one of those coaches, um, see who else has worked with them first before paying money, because there are some good ones out there and there are some ones who might not be worth it. Um, I'd say another piece of advice is take a uh, an objective look at your resume and change it up. Uh, we've gotten really into in higher education, creating more curriculum vita. So where if you've worked for five years in higher education, your resume should not be three pages long. Um, every little thing you've ever done shouldn't necessarily be on there. And recruiters for corporate world are not going to read three pages. Um, for most of our positions here at Stars, we don't even require a cover letter. So it's really, yeah, it, you got to be succinct and being able to, similar to what Neil was saying about the, the elevator pitch, you've really got to be, you've got to be able to paraphrase the words that you've done. Um, if you can look at a position description and utilize some of the key phrases there and translate it, that into your resume so they're actually matching, oh, we're looking for these skills. Hey, look, I've got these skills right here. Um, I would recommend really, really creating a different version of a resume. Honestly, we'll spend 60 seconds to 120 seconds on a resume. I'm looking for key things, education, skills, um, and then last job and longevity. If you're skipping around, you know, that's I'm just gonna next, next. <laughs> but like uh Catherine said, try to find out what the job description says and then incorporate it in your resume. I think that's key. If you can have some synergy there, as well as the education and skills part, you can do anything. Awesome. And Neil, I'm just put a link in here um, for this Teal website. Um, it looks incredible. So if you um, have a chance to click on the link and, and save it, definitely make sure you check that out, especially if you're thinking about exploring the possibility. Um, I know for me at one point, and maybe y'all can speak to this a little bit in our nine minutes that we have left, but, um, at one point I was like, I'm out, right? Like I thought COVID was getting me and my spirit. And, um, and then some things happened for me that I was like, yeah, it's not time yet. But I had a friend who said, um, you should create both a, a higher ed resume and a corporate or business resume. And like that practice alone was really, um, interesting. That exercise was really interesting, um, for a couple of different reasons. One, it told me how to figure out how to do a resume, um, that's not higher ed. Um, but then also like, as I started looking for jobs, I was like, oh, maybe I'm not there yet. Right. Um, but I, but I also started the process of thinking like, what would this look like and how this, um, how could this play out? So both ends of it. Look if you think you're curious. There's no harm in looking. Apply if you want to apply. There's no harm in applying. And ask vendors at the trade shows. You know, talk to them. Love it. There's also um, a program called Roadmap. I'm trying to find the link for it, but that I did that um, through my search. And that's really where I learned elevator pitches and 
pruning down my resume and talking to people and like all the things because it's different in higher ed than it is in the corporate world um, and getting used to that and mentally thinking about it that way it took a minute um, but the once I find it I'll throw it in here but the benefit of that program is they do chart if you don't make money which we don't in higher ed they have a reduced rate and their thing is once you get a job then pay us the rest of the money which for me sounds great i still haven't paid them the money yet after this move and i actually moved into their career accelerator program um and so now it's really focusing on all those bigger picture leadership things i need to think about like budgets and accomplishments and how to kind of manage people in a corporate world versus a higher ed world how to look at boundaries in this world like all these topic areas and so if that's the direction you want to go this might be a, another place to explore to get that like career transition help but then the, like the post transition help Uh, Tori shared a little nugget here in the chat as well that as an alum, she has career services available to her from um, her alma mater. So definitely check back with those career centers um, as well. Good suggestion. All right. Oh, and Neil shared another one. I'm just like copying and pasting these suckers and saving them in my favorites. Yeah. Um, Roadmap has a Slack channel that is free that you can go in and network and like poke at everything in. And they also have free workshops that they put on that you can just go join in and they'll talk to you about all these things. Awesome. Thank you so much for all these nuggets. This is awesome. Anything to make it easier. I wish I had some of this before I started. For sure. For sure. Well, I uh, we're, we're coming up here on our time. And so I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you so much to Lisa and Catherine and Neelam who joined in on the conversation um, and sharing a little bit about what it means to be a, a business partner, a vendor, you know, someone who is adjacent to the work that we do in higher education on a regular basis. Um, I know I have learned some really good things and hopefully other folks have also learned a little bit of good information. We appreciate appreciate your time spending with us. Um, so, um, so thank you for, for your words of wisdom and your, um, your experience and your sharing. Um, the Women in Housing Network uh, has virtual roundtables once a month. And so if folks are interested in topics, we would love to hear from you on any upcoming topics. I made a couple notes. LinkedIn might be something we should explore maybe in the future and how to set up your LinkedIn and make it work for you. Um, but if there's other topics that um, are things that folks would like to hear about or hear from others about or just be in conversation with other women identified professionals, please let us know. We would be happy to help coordinate and provide opportunities and space for folks to have those conversations. So um, wishing you all a very healthy uh, holiday season Hall closing time if you're not already there for those who are engaging in that. Um, and um, we will um, see you all hopefully in January. Thank you Thank for the opportunity, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Thanks, everyone.